Welcome, everyone. This is the 2024 Catherine Wasserman Davis Memorial Lecture. Um, it's sponsored annually by Wellesley College's Russian Area Studies Program. Am I echoing, or is this fine? Um, and the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard in memory of Mrs. Catherine Davis, Wellesley class of 1928, and a great benefactress of both of our institutions. Class of 28, right? Um, she actually had a great enthusiasm for Russia and published a book, her doctoral dissertation, um, on the USSR and the League of Nations. Um, she, her vibrant and vast uh, generous life journey came to the end in 2013 at the age of 106. Um, and Mrs. Davis's enthusiasm for all things Russian, dating back to her young adulthood when she traveled through the Caucasus on horseback on an anthropological expedition inspired more than 30 trips to the Soviet Union and Russia over the course of her remarkably long and active life. Some of us in Russian area studies, including me, knew her quite well and were very devoted to this extraordinary woman. She was also deeply invested in her projects for peace and surely would have been devastated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine two years ago um, and the ongoing calamitous Russo-Ukrainian war. This war continues its relentless march with some half a million military dead and wounded and high civilian casualties in Ukraine. How does the war resonate in Russia with Russians? Polls suggest that most Russians say they approve of the war and expect a Russian victory. Western sanctions have had little effect on Russia's economy. High, high oil prices mean robust cash reserves. Restaurants, theaters are thriving. What does this say about how various sectors of the Russian populace feel about this war and President Putin, whose upcoming election to his fifth term is a foregone conclusion? The, president election for, the presidential election for an upcoming sixth year, six year term will take place exactly one month from now, uh, starting on March 15th. I'm Nina Tamarkin. I'm a professor of history. I direct the college's Russian Area Studies program. I'm a decades, I don't want to tell you how many, long associate of Harvard's Davis Center. And as the host of this important event, um, I have actually relegated to myself the honor of introducing our distinguished speakers and our distinguished discussion moderator. It's a personal pleasure. I've known all of them for some years, in some case many years, as close colleagues and as friends. Our first speaker, Ivan Kurila, is the 2023-2024 Mary L. Cornell Distinguished Visiting Professor at Wellesley College. His teaching positions include the European University at St. Petersburg in History and International Relations, Volgograd State University, where he was teaching when he and I first met over 10 years ago, and George Washington University. He's published numerous monographs and journal and newspaper articles. His most recent book, The Battle for the Past, is a brilliant peroration on comparative global historical politics for which I had the pleasure to write a book blurb, actually my first blurb on the back of a Russian book, um, which is a kick. Professor Kurilov's specialty is Russian-U.S. relations in the 19th century, um, contemporary Russian-U.S. relations, and Russian historical and symbolic politics. We're thrilled to have him here at Wellesley for the semester. I'm delighted also to invite uh, Maria Lipman, who's a visiting research scholar at the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University, and editor of the Russia.Post website, which I um, asked the students in my first year seminar on Vladimir Putin to uh, read and look at and follow. 
Since 1995, she's been the editor or deputy editor of a range of Russian and English language publications and for years wrote an op-ed column on Russia for the Washington Post and a blog uh, for the New Yorker online. She's also taught courses on uh, contemporary Russia at Indiana University and Grinnell College in Iowa. And yesterday, she made a uh, proffered a brilliant presentation um, in my first year seminar on Vladimir Putin, which was really great. And I see a couple of students from there smiling broadly. Our panel moderator, Alec, Dr. Alexandra Vakru, is executive director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. Her scholarly work addresses Russian and Eurasian policy issues, including the war in Ukraine. She directs uh, graduate studies for the Davis Center's uh, master's degree program in regional studies, and she's mentored dozens of Harvard students and uh, regional experts. She's also, she also directs the uh, Davis Center's Scholars Without Border Pro Borders program. She's also teaching currently a course in Harvard's government department, um, and the course is on Russia's war in Ukraine. And I should tell you that Maria Lipman, Ivan Kudila, and I are all dying to see her syllabus. Um, so I'm delighted and honored to invite Alexandra Vakru, who's going to serve as moderator um, of this um, panel. So she'll say a few words, and, and then our speakers can. Yeah. Thank you, Nina, and thank you for coming. Uh, one of the thing that's, things that's really exciting about this event today is that we're going to be talking about what's happening inside Russia. So we do a lot of uh, discussion about the war, the military situation, what's happening in Ukraine, all of which is extremely important, but we tend to overlook what's happening inside Russia, primarily because it's so difficult to know. We can't go there anymore. We don't have access to free journalism the way we used to. We're left triangulating social media and relying on the people who are there and who are experts on Russia. We're so fortunate today to have two. We have Professor Ivan Kurila, who was not long ago coming from Russia uh, to join us, so he really knows what's going on on the ground. And of course, Masha Lipman, who's an incredible commentator and has been watching uh, the war very closely and is going to be able to tell us uh, all about her perceptions of what's happening. They also have some disagreements, so we're going to get into that as well. But let me invite Ivan to come up and start, and then Masha, and then we'll have a conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nina, thank you, Alexandra, for introduction and for everybody for coming here to, to discuss this. Um, well, this very painful for me as a Russian citizen uh, story, uh, the situation which is uh, continuing to develop in the wrong direction. For the last two years already, uh, the world people uh, in, in Europe and the United States uh, are uh, continuing to think what is going on in Russia and how it became possible in the 21st century that the uh, a country like Russia, which um, many uh, of the elder uh, generations uh, already started to think that was going on to uh, to the ideals of liberal democracy back in the 90s, uh, turned to be so hostile, and that uh, Russia started to shell uh, Ukrainian cities and kill Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, what's wrong with with the Russians? It's what's wrong with with Russia. And we inside Russia actually uh, ask ourselves the same questions. Uh, I know that uh, it was one of the possible responses to, to that was that okay, the Russians are like like this. Russians are bloodthirsty, or you know we can uh, recollect uh, stories of the. I don't know, of, of uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968 when the Soviet troops uh, suppressed uh, so-called Prague Spring, or in Hungary in uh, 1956 when uh, Soviet troops also suppressed the uh, Hungarian rebellion, or going back to the Tsarist time. So we always can uh, count something, uh, find something in the past which, uh, which can explain some, somehow what is going on. But it's not quite an explanation. 
as a, as a scholar of history, we, uh, scholar of history, I know, and uh, those who, who study history know that we can find uh, examples of anything in the past. We can find ex examples of the cruelty, but also uh, examples of the kindness, uh, examples of the, uh, of the assistance, of help, and uh, that was also a plenty in, in, in the Russian history. So are Russians so uh, bloodthirsty? Uh, are Russians as a people or as uh, you know, multiple persons uh, are so, uh, so bad, so cruel, so evil uh, as to uh, let, uh, let this uh, tragedy, this catastrophe uh, going on? And uh, I would say that, uh, of course, as, as a Russian, I, I, my, my response will be no, but I should sub, uh, somehow s substantiate what I'm what I going to say. And uh, you know what, we Russians uh, live now under the real dictatorship. That is, a, uh, we used to call it authoritarian regime or even some call it hybrid regime, but by uh, the year 2022, uh, Russians lived under the real dictatorship, and that is a, a situation when uh, no real, no protest uh, is tolerated anymore. Even the very peaceful uh, protest, uh, when you know, the protest which, which you know, people people uh, went to the streets just to, with the empty pieces of paper and were being arrested for that. And that is uh, actually the situation when any, uh, any protest can lead a person to uh, many years in jail, not just uh, arrest and release the next day, as it was uh, the case just 10 years ago, but uh, arrest and uh, sentence for seven years in prison, for 10 years in prison. So that's already uh, uh, equal to what, is go what, what happened in, in the Soviet Union under the Stalin regime. I mean, uh, that is still a difference. Uh, during Stalin regime, the repressions were widespread. I mean, the thousands of people and hundreds of thousands of people were arrested. It's not the case right now. But uh, for those who uh, became the victims of these repressions right now, for those who, who were arrested, uh, this is already the Stalin time, uh, Stalin time uh, punishment. That is something which, uh, you know, the, the, the terms in prison are equal to those that people could receive in the 30s. Oh. And that, is a, uh, that makes a, a, big, a big difference. So uh, how can we describe the uh, choices that Russians face uh, under this, in, the, in this situation? And there are, uh, there are choices. You know, that is, uh, I, sometimes I say that I'm jealous to those people who live, grew, grew up in the uh, liberal democracies. i jealous not because they live in, in uh, happiest or you know, more affluent uh, societies, but mostly because they are very rarely uh, are facing the choice uh, to be, you know, to be a, you know, a murderer or to be murdered. You know, that is this type of choices, which is, uh, which is not often uh, something you, you, or to betray or be betrayed, you know, to something which, and the dictatorship is a situation when like almost, not everybody of course, but many people faces this type of choices. This is okay, existential choices. And that is, uh, makes uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole life much more, uh, much more difficult. Uh, and I, I'm, I'll try to, to to describe these choices, and the choices are, well, we can use this uh, uh, scheme created by uh, Albert uh, Hirschman uh, like some 50 years ago, and many people know that uh, in social sciences that uh, there are three variants to, of reaction to whatever situation you face, or the change of situation you face. You can react with an exit, so you stop, participate, you try to, well, to, 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 to escape, to emigrate. Uh, exit, uh, voice, so you try to resist, you try to raise your voice and to, to change the situation. The third one is loyalty. You adapt to the situation and you try to, uh, to live through that situation. So, uh, and that is uh, exactly the variance we see among Russians, what Russians are doing. A huge number of Russians immigrated during the first months of the war and they continue to immigrate. There are plenty of Russians who, are, who never thought about immigration until 2022 and now uh, found themselves 
here in the United States, in Europe, in Armenia, in Kazakhstan, and many other places around the globe, because the only uh, only choice they, they found possible for them for them was was emigration. It was an exit. Another one was a voice, and I already described that in dictatorship the voice is costly. Some people who are who emigrated, and you know, Alexander probably remembered just yesterday that was an online conference, and one of the participants said that uh, immigration is not just the uh, exit, but also the voice. Well, uh, we can, uh, to some extent, say that those who immigrated and immigrated you know, vocally uh, opposing the, uh, the dictatorship and the war could probably count it as, 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 as uh, you know as raising their voice, but that's not exactly the voice which uh, was described by Hirschman and what is actually the social theory. But those who are inside Russia, uh, the voice is costly. I've already said that you can, uh, there are many cases uh, that people were sentenced to, uh, to many years in prison just for an attempt to protest the war, just for calling the war, war. You know, in the beginning of the early, in the spring of 2022, there was several, uh, widely you know, watched uh, cases when like, like local deputy, uh, local uh, representative in the, uh, in the local government uh, just called the war war, good enough, yeah, and he was sentenced for seven years in prison for that, just for that. And that is something which is everybody, of course, watching that, and that's make a lot of fear. So the state imposed uh, new laws, a series of new laws, which uh, somebody just recently counted. We already uh, the, this new laws already covered most of the infamous Stalin time 58 article of the criminal code. You know that was a criminal code article, which for uh, which uh, which a political uh, all the political prisoners of Stalin time were arrested, and that is we will almost like. Uh, Eight out of ten uh, sub subdivisions of that uh, article already in, in force, and uh, so people are fearful. So the state is uh, counter this possibility of voice with the uh, repressions, and the voice is costly. And still we have uh, still continue to have examples of voice. We still uh, see some protest protest in, in Russia. We see. And uh, now, by the end of the second year of war, we see uh, the protest from some you know, corners which uh, we, we should probably not, not thought about. We see the protest from the wives of the, uh, those people who were mobilized, drafted to participate in the war. So wives of those people protested recently uh, for continue, uh, continuing war, continuous war in there. That was a, some uh, part of the protest we, uh, we just recently uh, saw. There was a, uh, different types of, uh, of, of voice, uh, you know, there was almost no, uh, no places where to, to, to raise a voice. But when some possibility emerged, uh, many people wanted to, to, to raise that voice. Uh, one of the recent one was, uh, that was the beginning of the uh, presidential election campaign. Of course, everybody understood that was not in real elections, but it's still some procedures were, were going on, including the procedure of, uh, uh, you know, of, of candidates to be uh, emerging candidates which wanted to, to participate in the, uh, uh, in the elections. Of course, uh, no real uh, opponents of Mr. Putin were permitted to, to participate at all. But uh, on the first stage, that was uh, a candidate, uh, Nadezhdin, Boris Nadezhdin, yeah, who, um, well, who was not actually the big opponent of Putin. He was always uh, like a compromised man. He is ready to, to make a compromise. But he, what he, he did, he said it from the very beginning he, that he was against the war. Okay, he was not uh, calling the war the crime. It was, you know, it, it's, it's can, you cannot imagine it in the contemporary Russia. Of course, he did not say that Russia should cede all of the territories it's conquered. But he said that the war should be stopped. And that was immediately uh, brought uh, thousands of people for his support. 
that was we just saw like a huge lines of people who wanted to, to, to leave their science in support of his participation in the, uh, in the elections. And that was a, a new phenomena, which uh, was also the attempt for, so where else can, can you raise your voice? At least you participate in this alliance. Of course, Nadezhdin was not permitted to, to run finally, but that was a moment of, of, of voice. And uh, the third one, probably the biggest uh, number of Russians uh, choose loyalty. And that is something which usually uh, seen as a support of war. You know, many people say, okay, Russians support the war. Russian, uh, I would argue against that. I mean, uh, of course, there are Russians who support the war, but this is a quite a, uh, like real minority, those who really want to war. It's, I mean, it's not normal. But many people choose loyalty and uh, looking from their loyalty to the current state. They are loyal to, to those uh, who are in power, to they are loyal to Putin. And they support Putin as they support Putin when Putin started the war. So they supported war. If Putin next day, tomorrow, will decide to stop the war, they will support the end of the war. The same groups will be happy to stop the war. But loyalty is their uh, choice. We can uh, discuss uh, like the moral uh, burden of th this type of, of, of the choice. And of course, we can say that this is uh, something which uh, the choice was uh, let people uh, you know, share the, uh, the guilt, not just the responsibility. We all share the responsibility for what is going on, but uh, share even part of the guilt for, for the crimes that the Russian state is doing right now. But, uh, but I would say that uh, uh, to be loyal to the state, it's quite normal in any society. People are loyal to the cruel regimes, mostly. People are loyal to the regimes which are going to war. And what, uh, what is interesting in the Russia today, one of the small uh, features, small, I would say, uh, piece of news which uh, illustrates uh, my, my, my thought, uh, one of the, uh, the, group, the group of books which became best sellers during the last two years is a translation translations of the books written by Germans about the life in Germany during Nazi. You know, never before uh, Russians were so interested in reading about how Germans lived under Nazi regime. It was, well, you know, in, in all the like Russian national feelings, okay, Nazis, we were Nazis, we were enemies, we won a war against Nazism, we, so that was just, uh, we cannot associate ourselves with Nazis. Now we have a like, skyrocketing sales of the books uh, of uh, people like Sebastian Hafner about the life of, uh, what is it? Well, I don't know English translation of the titles, but you can look up for it. And that is something which Russians start to, to see, how, how the people lived under the, the Nazi regime. So that is uh, something which uh, actually illustrates the, uh, the situation in, in Russia with loyalty. And the very last, I probably was already talking a bit too much, but I, I, I then will we'll continue our conversation. But the very last uh, thing, uh, Alexandra mentioned that I just recently uh, came from Russia. So I should probably share also the kind of feeling, feelings which is, uh, that is still, uh, you know, looking from afar, it looks like, okay, Russians are going on, they continue the like usual life. There is, uh, there are restaurants open, there are like, see, movie theaters and theaters and uh, whatever cultural life which is going on. Uh, indeed, it is so. Uh, but at the same time, I would say that it does not mean that people feel the same or people feel that there is nothing, go uh, nothing happens. And uh, that is still people, you know, those who understand what is going on. Well, people living in big cities, people are better educated, who are feeling, they're just feeling that they spent the first uh, months or first year of the war just in, in a big despair in, 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 in uh, uh, in, a, in a very a bad psychological uh, feelings and situation, but then they started to normalize. Normal, well, it's if, I, if, if there is an English word for, for that, normaliza normalization. And somebody has also mentioned yesterday that normalization uh, is different from 
routinization. Yeah. And that is, uh, so that is something which you, you cannot live without the future. And that is something which is, uh, we, uh, the start of the war actually uh, nullified all the future for, for Russia. All the plans which we, we made we were just, uh, we can throw away. And that was uh, after several months of the uh, war, people started to recreate some plans, some, because they just cannot live without the future. You live there, you can do nothing. I mean, that was a situation when you uh, have to, to, to invent something for, for your own life. And that is a part of that situation. For the other part, for those who live in the smaller cities, the smaller towns in the countryside, actually those places where the ma majority, most of the mobilized people were drafted from, those who fight in the Ukraine are mostly people from the small towns in, in, the, in the countryside. And in those, uh, in those uh, part of the population, I would say, that is also a lot of uneasy feelings because relatives husbands, brothers are on the front line, and others who are still here are afraid they can be mobilized any day. Of course, they are paid a lot. I mean, there is a, one of the uh, government, uh, government leverage to, to, to let people uh, to participate in the war. They, uh, they receive huge, huge money on their account uh, compared to their usual uh, salaries. But uh, it's still uneasy. It's still uneasy, and people uh, in the small cities, people who are who do not uh, speak about Putin as a uh, as a criminal, who do not uh, think about uh, the war as unjust war, but they think about the war as a war. That's something which actually uh, threatens the lives of of, of, of their uh, of their relatives, of their close uh, people to them. And of course, there are also people who live in the uh, border cities, like Belgrade. You know, Belgrade is a Russian city not far from the Ukrainian city. And it's already became tar target of, uh, of Ukrainian shelling. And there are also uh, people who died there. I mean, people, civil people, I mean, not military people, uh, even including children including. And that means that the war com comes back to the Russian territory as well. And of course, for Russians in Russia, for almost for any Russians, uh, what is going on is a tragedy. Maybe they uh, uh, perceive the tragedy, of course they perceive it differently compared to Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are much, much more suffering because of the Russian shelling, because of the war, which is, uh, like, uh, became the everyday uh, experience for them. But it's morally, it's, uh, it's very bad. I mean, that is something which uh, makes the life in Russia very unpleasant thing right now. And I can share you my own feeling, and I stopped here. Uh, when, I, uh, when my plane uh, leave, left Russia months ago, and when I hit it here, I just feel like, well, now I can breathe. And that is that I feel that for two years I did not breathe the full, whole, uh, whole breast. OK, I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everyone, um, who came to listen to us today. Thank you, Nina, so much for the invitation, for the introduction. Thank you for being an excellent friend of so many years. Thank you, Alexandra, for the introduction as well. Um, Alexandra promised that we will disagree with Ivan. <laughs> I, I'm afraid I will not live up to that expectation. Uh, we have different experience. Uh, Ivan has been in Russia through this war, as he just said. Um, my family and I left uh, very soon after the war began in early March. Uh, so I'm looking at Russia uh, uh, with a lot of interest, professional interest, human interest, but still from afar. And this makes my take and my experience different. Um, so I guess I will not disagree with Ivan, but I will probably supplement something of what he said with uh, uh, saying things basically about the same. Uh, this is our topic today. Um, how do people in Russia go through it? What do they feel? Um, 
month after month, uh, polls have shown that an overwhelming majority of Russians support the war. Um, this has caused disappointment, disappointment in the West among those who thought that the Russian people would rise against a brutal, horrible war and somehow uh, topple their government. Uh, this also has caused lots of disappointment among those who left Russia, among those who thought that it was no longer possible for them to live in a country which invaded, brutally invaded its closest neighbor. Um, um, this disappointment is one of the reasons, I think, why opinion polls are seen as invalid, misleading, and so on, and a lot has been written about it. Um, several points may be important here. Uh, what lies behind the 70 plus percent Russians who has said month after month that they support this special military operation the way um, one has to refer to the war in Russia? Uh, the issue here is that relying on just one straightforward question leads to a huge oversimplification. In fact, to a point of creating a distorted picture. There's plenty of polling done and other data uh, uh, is available, uh, data from focus groups, data from in-depth interviews, which actually suggest a much more nuanced picture. Just one point, and uh, uh, it is my uh, strong belief that polls are not only not, uh, um, um, not invalid, but uh, there is nothing but polls for us to get an idea of what people at large feel. There is nothing like that. Uh, we still rely on polls because otherwise it's anecdotal. However, the matter is how uh, one interprets the poll and how much data is included in one's analysis. And that's, I think, a very important point. Um, so if we look at the polls again, at the national poll done by the Vater Center, Russia's best veteran uh, um, uh, um, uh, polling organization that has worked in Russia from uh, um, shortly before, uh, the uh, end of the Soviet Union and all through the post-Soviet period. So one question they are asking every month, and actually this is also very important, how um, the results may change, not just a one-off. So we answer this question, we ask this question today, we get the answer, here's the answer, we're disappointed, and we think, oh my God, no, this is not. Who can ac actually rely on public opinion polls at the time of war? Co of course, people are lying, or as they say in sociology, they falsify their preferences. But look at another question, the interest in the war. Every month, the other center is asking this question, do you follow the war? And you would think that in a country at war, people will be watching very intently at what goes on. However, only about half Russians say that they follow the war closely, or rather closely, this is how the question is asked. Among young Russians, this number is about one third. Uh, Ivan mentioned that uh, there are staunch supporters of the war, uh, and they are a minority, and this is what polls show too. Polls show that about 20% Russians can be described as warmongers, asking to a variety of different questions, uh, but at, at the end of the day, uh, they want the war to continue. And this is a minority of about 20%. Now, um, falsification of preferences is a phenomenon that is certainly at play, and by the way, not only in Russia, not only at the time of war. People tend to falsify their preferences for a variety of reasons, one of them being their social environment. So you somehow tend to not be, most of us do, uh, tend to be not too different from those around you. And uh, if it, uh, come, when it comes to politics, there is only always a minority of people who actually follow the events, compare different sources, and form their independent opinion. The majority of us is not this way. Uh, now, people are not interested. What does this mean? And actually, uh, Ivan has spoken about it. Um, there's every reason to believe that to most Russians, the war is disturbing, it is disquieting, and uh, there is no way for them to do anything about it. And what do you do to preserve your, your sanity? You try not to think about it. You try to think as little as possible. You try as much as it is only possible to turn your back, 
to the war. To the war. Of course, you cannot do this if you uh, fight at the front or if your loved ones are there. But this is not a majority of Russians. This is only a minority of Russians still today. Uh, and falsifications or not, there is Ill, still a minority of, of Russians who even in public opinion polls say that they do not support the special military operation. They too are a minority. So we have a minority of warmongers in a slightly lower minority of people who choose A, to answer the question, not to uh, send the pollster to hell, uh, and say, no, I do not support the special military operation. There's a great deal more to be said about public opinion polls and how they are and not are, and not, are not uh, informative. Um, but uh, uh, th these are just a few examples. Um, according to public opinion polls, uh, almost half Russians speak in favor of peace talks, with about one third in favor of the war to go on. Sounds good. And uh, actually, uh, we tend to believe this poll because it tells us something that uh, is more encouraging. However, um, uh, when the question is asked in more detailed way, uh, people are all for peace talks. Many of them are. However, um, um, they are uh, ready for Russia to engage in peace talks uh, with a condition that what's ours is ours. And the territories that has been gained, according to the people in Russia, should remain Russian. Putin, who had, has given actually a variety of very different rationales for this war, uh, fairly recently used the word gains. Uh, and for those of you who have Russian, he said, our gains, territorial gains. And this is shared by many Russians. What's ours is ours. We have fought for two years. This should be ours. And peace talks are fine, but uh, with uh, uh, under a condition that um, uh, these territories remain, remain Russian. Um, also, when people are asked who should be entrusted with peace talks, the, the answer is overwhelmingly. Of course, Putin, because he's in charge of everything. He started this war. He should conduct peace talks. Um, there is, uh, um, you know, a uh, people who are all for war, the warmongers, there are all those who are against. Uh, but one perception that I think is very broadly shared in the Russian society, also a disappointing kind of attitude, is that people tend to be anti-anti-war by which I mean that there is no approval of those who rise against the war. Ivan mentioned this uh, relatively new movement of the wives of the mobilized, uh, women who are desperate to get their uh, um, husbands back, uh, and the name of the organization is Road Home. Uh, so a very obvious demand, which uh, as far as I rem if I remember uh, correctly, was also uh, very popular during the war in Vietnam in this country. Bring our boys back. Uh, these women are not against the war. They are not interested in such, uh, uh, you know, in something that probably looks too abstract to them, but they want their husbands back home alive. They are desperate. They are a challenge to the government because the government will uh, n stop before repressing these women, before arresting, at least for now. They get away with what they are doing. Uh, they are a problem. Uh, and the government apparently understands that they are desperate and uh, uh, their cause is such that they will not compromise. They cannot be bored with payments, they cannot be somehow duped into believing something that they don't believe. Uh, thing is that there is no public support for this movement. And this is what I mean by uh, people are generally broadly anti-anti-war. Um, Ivan mentioned uh, this uh, recent, uh, actually failed presidential campaign, or should I say presidential campaign of Boris Nadezhdin, um, a candidate that who somehow sprang up unexpectedly 
to emerge as a uh, anti-war candidate. And indeed, there were lines across Russia. He had to collect 100,000 uh, signatures, and the Russian uh, uh, election law has it that these signatures should be s distributed more or less evenly across the country, no more than 2,500 in every locality. So this means uh, um, uh, many different cities, about 40. Um, Boris Nadezhdin uh, spoke again <coughs> against the war and even critically about Putin, uh, especially criticizing him for starting the war. Uh, the lines in uh, on the cities of Moscow turned out to be completely unexpected. Apparently, a government's mistake. The, uh, um, the, the signatures that uh, Boris Nadezhdin was collecting uh, were necessary, according to the uh, electoral law in Russia, for him to be put on the ballot. Had he collected 100,000 signatures, he would have appeared on the, on the ballot. Uh, he su submitted uh, 105,000 signatures, but the electoral committee, not unexpectedly, uh, return them by saying uh, these signatures, some of these signatures are invalid, and this was enough not to let him run for president. Now, um, those people who signed for him, okay, around 100,000 people, did they rebel? Did they say, your electoral committee are actually playing dirty games here? It's not about signatures. It shouldn't be about signatures. He has undoubted public support. There was nothing of the sort. Now, why did people even dare? Why weren't they afraid to take to the streets and wait in lines, visibly saying, we are all for this candidate who spe is speaking against the war? Because it is legal. Because, <laughs> at least at this point in Russia, uh, it is legal to, uh, uh, to sign up for a candidate for him to be able to run. But, uh, then uh, um, rising against the decision of the electoral committee is not legal. People say, well, of course it is technically legal. Uh, we still have in the Constitution the right of free expression, but uh, everyone understands that this would be seen as an anti-government act. And not unexpectedly, there were no protests in the street. Not unexpectedly, uh, the wives of the mobilized do not get broad public support and even modest public support because the uh, people in Russia understand that this would be seen as an anti-government act. Um, still, uh, according to uh, lots of um, Russian commentators, uh, what happened with Boris Nadezhdin's short-lived and failed campaign was unexpected and therefore is set back for the government. Uh, the government somehow miscalculated. The government did not realize that anti-war sentiments were broader, and as soon as there was, as Ivan said, an opportunity, people took to the streets. Um, in the summer of last year, there was another setback, which looked to be actually more serious than that. Um, I'm sure many of you remember the so-called Prigozhin's mutiny. Prigozhin was not Nadezhdin, he was not a politician. He was a brutal military commander, empowered by Putin himself. Um, he, uh, he was leading an army of convicts who were released from um, uh, penal colonies, especially to go fight in the front. Uh, a uh, a br brutal man who uh, was fighting uh, for, for Russia at the front, but was very critical first of the mil Russian military commanders, uh, and he was, uh, I mean, how do I put it, an informal military commander uh, empowered by President Putin himself. So he was speaking very negatively about the formal military commanders, and at some point uh, he moved uh, to Moscow. And that was called a march to Moscow by a brutal military commander with his uh, uh, armed convicts. And it looked like it was a real mutiny. Well, it didn't end this way. He stopped before uh, reaching Moscow. But no doubt, he was greeted on the way, which was also quite unexpected. People were greeting a person who was moving to Moscow with, uh, you know, his message was more or less that he's going to I know, toppled the government, seized the Kremlin. 
This never happened. Uh, what happened later on, um, uh, he was, he's, the plane on which he was about to fly um, uh, was downed and he was killed. Suspicions have it that um, this was not an accident, but actually a premeditated uh, murder by the government as an act of revenge um, for, for his act of mutiny. Now, um, this has led some people to say that the Russian regime is actually vulnerable. The, the Russian regime has suffered a second setback, serious setback, which has to do with public support. Um, um, so a second in something like seven or eight months. Now, this is one way to look at it, that this makes the regime looks vulnerable. Another way to look at it is that the Kremlin is good at managing setbacks. It got rid of the uh, brutal mutineer, and um, um, it uh, disqualified Boris Nadezhdin as a presidential candidate, and it is not facing any resistance anymore. Well, we're not sure, we're never sure what might happen next. However, Putin is in power for 20 plus, plus years. These two are not the first setbacks in his career. We had terrorist attacks, we had financial crises, we had natural calamities, we had all kinds of crises, and uh, uh, Putin's uh, uh, approval rating never went below 660 plus and is currently at 80 plus and this has been the range over the 20, 20 plus years. Um, now public reaction that uh, Ivan described as uh, like the most common um, uh, um, description is the, the largest group is people who are loyal and I fully agree with that. And I think this is a uh, um, an apt word to describe it, and this is not something new. This is not something that we didn't know about the Russian people. You know, uh, it is only uh, two years uh, that uh, um, sociological and other um, uh, social scientific research is impossible in Russia. Uh, for 20 plus years, for 30 plus years, Actually, uh, research, uh, researchers enjoyed uh, freedom of academic work, and we have tremendous amount of very important, uh, very salient uh, research done. We know uh, uh, what public attitude is like, and some of the features of um, uh, public attitudes in Russia can be described by a willingness to adjust and cling to stability, something that Ivan was talking about. This is not new. Um, and it may be sliding stability, but, but still there's a very strong desire to cling to it. There is a sense of acquiescence, maybe another word to describe uh, loyalty. <clears throat> there is uh, a, a ready surrender of political responsibility. Uh, there is a tendency to encapsulate in one small world. Again, this is not new. This uh, uh, has not emerged with this war. And uh, there is a general aversion to political activism and organization. Social activism is a different story, and we had a lot of that in the previous years and uh, um, even uh, some episodes today. But political activism and political organization is not something that uh, people are keen to join. <clears throat> um, there can be tons of ways to gauge the public opinion in order to get a more nuanced picture. And uh, questions are asked and results are received and analyzed. And both Russian and American scholars continue to engage in public opinion research. Uh, the important question is, how does it matter? The Kremlin's main goal is for people not to be a hurdle. And uh, one um, piece of evidence for it is that the Kremlin called mass mobil partial mobilization uh, in September 2022, um, the public reaction was quite stormy. Uh, lots and lots of young men fled Russia. Putin's popularity dropped once again to 60 plus, which by the Kremlin standards is low. 
And even though there is an acute shortage of men at the front, Putin lingers. We're not sure whether he will change his mind, but he'll, he lingers and he does not call mobilization. Uh, people who fight at the front are um, either contract soldiers uh, or uh, there are different categories, but, but um, mass mobilization is, is not called. So people should not be a hurdle, and they might be a hurdle uh, if mass mobilization is, call, is called, or at least this is what um, the Kremlin is concerned about. Um, the story of uh, Nadezhdin, Boris Nadezhdin, the presidential candidate, and the story of uh, the wives of the mobilized show that people are not a hurdle. However uh, dramatic the change of policy has been in Russia, Still, uh, the Kremlin is able to wage this policy. It is not that the Kremlin is not concerned. It always is. It is always on the alert. Setbacks happen, but it, generally, it is generally on the alert. But uh, um, Putin remains unchallenged and uncontested. And uh, um, uh, to me, this dilemma of whether the regime is vulnerable or um, in fact, uh, the regime is very good at um, managing setbacks. To me, the answer is in the latter. Now, um, Ivan, uh, at the beginning of uh, um, his presentation, uh, was talking about from, uh, that the Russian political system has turned from uh, in authoritarian states to a, to a dictatorship. And uh, um, of course, I agree. There used to be a time um, early in Putin's tenure when uh, the Russian state was described by a prominent Russian sociologist as a uh, non-intrusive. For those who uh, speak Russian, a very, a very apt description of, of the regime, non-intrusive state. Politics is none of your business was the uh, message that the government was sending to the people and the message was taken. But other than that, there was a broad avenue for self-expression in virtually any sphere except the political one. Uh, social, in business, in art, in any kind of creation activities. Today, uh, we live in a situation where there are ubiquitous and tightening constraints in basically every sphere. Uh, it goes to, uh, uh, it applies to education uh, and uh, um, intense uh, um, in, in inculcation of patriotism the way the government sees it in both schools and colleges and universities. This applies to the media. Uh, we had quite a number of non-governmental media, uh, which uh, uh, had very professional and digitally savvy and uh, brave uh, and in every way excellent journalists. All of them, uh, or well, f with very rare exceptions, uh, um, had to um, quit Russia, had to leave Russia, flee from Russia, um, or they faced very serious consequences for themselves. Um, we have many, many dozens of uh, media publications which are now in exile, and about, a, um, about 500 journalists who also had to flee Russia following the um, large-scale invasion in Ukraine. This goes much farther than that. It goes to art, it goes to pop culture, with a lot of very popular um, pop cultural figures who were forced to leave Russia because apparently the government does not want these popular figures with their large audiences and their devoted fans uh, to be able to um, uh, tell people what they think about the war. It has also affected book publishing and distribution, which was never the case before, even at times of crackdowns. Um, uh, this never applied to book publishing and distribution. And it has also, uh, um, and uh, 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 you probably, I'm, I'm sure all of you heard about it, it has also um, reached the uh, private sphere. First and foremost, this applies to uh, the LGBTQ community. 
um, you know, the uh, uh, um, kind of uh, rhetoric that we hear and the kind of uh, legislation that has been made over the years uh, which attacks LGBTQ people may sound pretty absurd at times, but uh, it's very tragic for those who fall victim of this policy. Now, uh, uh, to give you one example, just to cheer, cheer you up a little bit, uh, even though there is nothing, actually nothing funny about it, um, there is a, uh, a very popular app uh, which enables people to teach themselves foreign languages called Duolingo. It offers programs in about 40 different languages, and uh, I myself used it, and many other people do. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent app, uh, and uh, uh, is used not just in Russia, but all over the world. Now, it is under investigation in Russia right now, because um, um, looking through the countless dialogues and texts and uh, recordings, in that app, uh, somebody in Russia found examples which said um, Bourbon George had just got married or some such. And that was enough for this whole app uh, uh, to, to, um, uh, to come under investigation. Um, well, one, I will say one more thing about the Russian Orthodox Church. This is, yeah, um, yeah this is the last thing I'm going to say. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church um, is, uh, um, has engaged in repressing its own priests. The Russian Orthodox Church, as applies to the top um, clergy, um, and the Russian Orthodox Church is a hierarchical institution, quite unlike Protestant churches, of course. It's a national church with a very strict hierarchy. So the top clergy have pledged full allegiance to the state, and uh, have uh, uh, engaged in repressing their own. If there is a priest uh, which disobeys and uh, who, dares, who dares speak against the war, um, he is first punished by the church uh, itself, being defrocked. Um, this has happened already to several priests. And uh, this is uh, one more very depressing development. Now to um, end, uh, at a not such a grim note, um, I will return to public opinion polls, which give us all kinds of results. And for instance, um, um, a polling agency, not the one that I quoted before, but a uh, fairly uh, professional polling agency that continues to do research in Russia, asked people what kind of candidate would they want for president. In Russia, we're going to have presidential election next month. It is not such a uh, dramatic and uh, politically uh, uh, stormy event as in this country, but we are still going to have a presidential vote. Uh, so the question was not, uh, you know, Putin or not Putin. The question was, um, what kind of person would you like uh, to see as the Russian president? It asked people whether they would accept a woman for president. It asked people whether it would accept a person over 70 years old, and Putin is 71. And it asked people whether they would accept somebody from the LGBT community for president. Now, uh, age turned out to be a very important factor, and 68% um, of people said they would not want a person over 70 years old for president. Now, Putin's rating is uh, over 80%, and this gives us some idea about what uh, polls can and cannot do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masha, uh, Maria, sorry. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that over 500 journalists have left Russia since the war began. And it raises the question for me of how people are getting their news about the war. You know, if they are, if it's permeating everything, which is the kind of uh, atmosphere that Yvonne was talking about, or even if they're deliberately not looking at it, there still must be sources of information that are common across different populations. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
right. Uh -huh. um, I would start by saying that people in Russia are not disinformed. I mean, some are, but I would say that a majority of people, uh, certainly in large urban centers and in smaller, uh, in smaller cities, uh, people are reasonably well informed. Um, and I think it was clear from, about, from uh, what Ivan said and what I myself said, that it is not about we don't know about the war. Maybe we don't want to know, but we certainly do know. Now, I wonder whether especially, well, probably young people in the audience know what VPN is. Do you? <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> now, a VPN is a contraption. I'm not a great expert in these things. I'm not exactly sure how to uh, you know, characterize it, but it's something that uh, enables you uh, to um, get online to a resource that is blocked. And uh, um, this is uh, VPNs are used not just in Russia, it is used in various countries for a variety of reasons. Iran is a great user of VPNs. The Russian government has um, blocked, after the beginning of the war, quite a few platforms and, of course, uh, um, uh, media outlets. Uh, Facebook is blocked, Twitter is blocked, TikTok is blocked. Um, YouTube is not, which is interesting. Um, and Telegram, uh, which is in very large use in Russia, is not. So Telegram channels have become extremely popular in Russia. The popularity and the audience that is uh, connected to Telegram channels, any number of them, has risen very significantly in, uh, uh, in the course of these two, uh, of these two years. Um, those uh, journalists who emigrated um, rely on uh, VPNs, rely on their audiences back home, uh, which uh, that will connect, uh, be able to connect on VPN. Uh, most of them have their own Telegram channels. So the question is not so much that um, there are no sources. The question is, do you? Are you interested? Are you interested enough to um, 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 go to the trouble of using contraptions and uh, um, overcoming uh, the, block, uh, the, 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 uh, the government's blocking. Um, the constituency, uh, even before the crackdown, the constituency of those who would um, read and watch and listen to uh, um, non-governmental media, the media that uh, was not loyal to the government, was small. It never was very large. It amounted to, well, roughly 20 percent, 20 plus percent in Moscow, the capital, the largest city, and under 10 percent nationally. Uh, to us in Moscow and St. Petersburg, I was in Moscow, uh, Ivan is in St. Petersburg, uh, we didn't have this sense. Everyone around us, of course, read them. And I think those same constituencies, those same people who remained, who were back home, and Ivana up until very recently, did not change their reading habits. I don't think they did. But some people probably have. Um, it is not that this whole digital world is filled with anti-war messages. as anywhere. It can be different. It can be pro-war. Uh, the warmongering audience that I mentioned has their own, the so-called military correspondence telegram channels, and they have large audiences too. So, um, you know, to make a long story short, there's no shortage of information, and uh, the obstacles are not bad enough for people who are really keen on getting this information to be unable to have it. The question is, uh, you know, after a while, we don't have these statistics, we don't have these polls. After a while, if you're sick of living in, a, uh, in an environment that is oppressive, in an environment that, uh, which reminds you on a daily and hourly basis about the war, you're probably watching less, you're probably reading less. Not everyone, but I'm sure, you know, anecdotal evidence certainly is there. 
And in my publication, I published a, a sociologist who um, conduct not necessarily polls, but in-depth interviews. This uh, effect of fatigue is certainly there. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I well, I tend to agree to what to, to what Maria just said, but uh, I still want to to to, to add some uh, correction or amendment, because uh, of course we speak when we speak about Saint Petersburg or Moscow, it's true, one hundred percent true. But uh, there are not a small portion of the population, like elderly people, who do not and never used uh, internet as a source of information. For them, still TV, television is a major source of information. There are younger people, not, not, not the youth, but people not, not that yet elderly, like of my age probably, who uh, live in the small cities and who never interested in the, before that, never, never, never was interested in political news. And all the political news was, uh, well, again, TV translation. They did use uh, internet, but looking for entertainment there. Mm -hmm. And they continue to use it. That's actually what, what Mar uh, Maria said. But it was, you know, uh, I still there are a big portion of the population which has no, uh, it's not, I cannot say that they have no access if they wanted to, 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 to find uh, another kind of information, they probably can. But they never did it in their life. And that's, that's why for them it's easier to rely on, on the TV. And when they are, like say children, for instance, try to say, you know what is going on in fact, did you see? And they say, this is your propaganda. I mean, we, we stick to our propaganda, which is on TV, and this is a balance. I mean, mm -hmm. that you, you, sp you speak about your propaganda, you, 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 you watch it on the YouTube channel, channels. And that is how, how this big portion of population is operating. Still, television is an important uh, source of information, and those people like Solovyov who are, is, uh, still had a huge audience, and that is unfortunately uh, truth of that. So w one of the things that we, uh, we noticed after 2014 and the annexation of Crimea is that it really brought out some of the divisions that people had. You know, people who assumed that their circles around them were liberal and that, of course, they wanted to be kind of like Europe were shocked to find out that some of their close acquaintances actually thought it was perfectly okay for Russia to annex Crimea. And there was this big division in, uh, or big split in personal relationships. I'm wondering if you've noticed the same thing now, if it's, if it's that nobody will talk about the war because it's just too risky, or if you're also seeing very clear divisions in sort of the people you used to be close to who now have very different opinions and you just don't socialize with them or talk to them anymore. Yeah, so I will start yeah. this time. Yeah. Uh, yes, that is a good question. You know, you know, there's first of all there is a difference between 2014 and 2022. In 2014, I did uh, witness a lot of celebration. You know, a lot of people around me were very happy about that, and that was a period. Uh, I would say uh, that was a time when I I felt very uneasy about my uh, fellow fellow citizens. In 2022. I did not see anybody who celebrated. In, in, in February of 2022, everybody around me were just very gloomy, and even those who later go on to, to support the war. But mm -hmm. the first, first days, first weeks were a big, uh, you know, produced a very negative, a negative impact. But uh, as for the split, there is a split, and there are, there are a lot of splits in, in, in the families and with old friends. And you know, since the February 24 of 2022, uh, when you, uh, you know, uh, I know by, by my own and by my friends' uh, experience, people are afraid to get in touch with some old friends of somebody because we do not know how they are, mm -hmm. uh, really. so what, what is their opinion. We do not want to be disappointed, we do not want to cut the relations, let's, let's not contact at all. Uh, that, is, that makes many, uh, I would say, network, friend, friend, friendship networks uh, smaller and but more more or less like homogeneous in mm -hmm. terms of, and that was what what, what happened in, in in the last two years. And uh, of course, uh, people also well, relatives so some 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 somehow tried to escape the big split because we already experienced several such splits, and that was a. Um, also the experience of, of, of many families and I also know that, as, that some people decided not to discuss 
the war, and that is actually one of the reasons why people do not discuss it. They do not want the personal split. Mm -hmm. They do not. They do not discuss the war in some in big companies in the family uh, circle just because they, they want to keep at least uh, you know at least. Uh, peace inside this uh, inner circle. We, we call this the Thanksgiving dinner problem. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> like, yeah, you, yeah. you don't want to ask the uncle for his yeah. opinion. Yeah, I would just add, I totally agree. I would just add um, one more thing to it. Many families have relatives in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And in Russia, you know, it is very, very common uh, to have somebody who lives in Ukraine and with whom they used to be close. Uh, travel between the country what countries was easy was easy phone you know all modern communications people well you know to the extent that they could they traveled or they were closely in touch when the war began it was really tragic because uh, you know those uh, both sides thought that uh, the uh, respective relative became a monster you know seeing things in a totally wrong light accusing each other, yelling at each other. What you're telling me is propaganda. This is what your television is telling you. Uh, uh, people in Ukraine were trying to get through to their relatives, uh, to their friends, to say that we're being bombed. We're in a bomb shelter. And people in Russia, well, of course not everyone, but this happened a lot, would say, we don't believe you. This is nonsense. This is your propaganda. Very, well, you know, this is not, our army cannot do this. And then brutalities and horrific brutalities began. And again, you know, we don't believe this. This is not happening. This is not what Russian people can do. There was so much of that. And of course, the only way out of this situation is, you know, either you stop communication altogether or what you described as uh, the Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, you know, you still get together, but you try not to talk, not to touch upon, which is not easy, not to touch upon these uh, divisive subjects. Well, one of the things I've noticed when, uh, when I talk to audiences about what's happening, sorry. <laughs> when I talk to audiences about what's happening in Russia, they say, you know, how can Russians be so indifferent? We see all these terrible things that are happening. Like, how is it possible that, that, uh, that they're not reacting? And, uh, and I think back when the United States was in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and most people woke up every day and never gave it a second thought, right? I mean, it's exactly what you were saying, that you just, you normalize it or you don't think about it or it's just irrelevant to you and so it doesn't matter. And yet, I wonder if the situation is different when we're talking about a dictatorship, right? Is it that um, we should expect less because people are oppressed and frightened and, and can actually have serious consequences? Or do we expect more because we think, okay, like this is the last straw. How much more do you need to see before you push up against this regime? Well, I think Ivan spoke very well about it. Intimidation works. And uh, it's not that uh, intimidation started on day one of the war. We had at least 10 years, I would say 12, ever since 2012, which was a turning point in the Russian history when the government turned away from, uh, well, being relatively mildly oppressive to becoming uh, uh, really oppressive. There was a reason for that. There were mass protests in, in, in Russia. I would not go into it, but. Um, there was one of those setbacks when we had 100,000 people uh, in Moscow alone and uh, tens of thousands elsewhere chanting Russia without Putin or Putin is a thief. And the government responded and it, res it responded by cracking down. And since then, the, it, it has been an inexorable trend. Uh, the regime grew more and more and more repressive. And of course, uh, uh, the, the uh, final turn if it's a final turn, uh, two years ago when the war began, was the most dramatic of all. So at first it was, you know, people after mass protests in 2012 were uh, um, detained, but some were arrested and sentenced to three or four years. Not too many, but this came as a shock because people did not expect that, because before that, you know, uh, there was, as I mentioned, there was relative freedom of self-expression in Russia. Uh, and then, you know, more bans and more restrictions and more constraints. 
Um, so uh, by the time the war began, the uh, original shock, because I mean, I've, I mean, it's very important what Ivan said. Nobody was rejoicing. Not a single person in Russia was rejoicing that uh, uh, Russia uh, invaded Ukraine. You know, the, 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 uh, you know, many people were in a state of shock. Um, so there was an original protest. It was suppressed quite brutally. People were detained and arrested and sentenced. Uh, media began to be blocked. Journalists began to leave. Uh, and then more and, and more people were leaving, some because, well, for moral reasons, you know, I can not live in this country which has invaded its closest neighbor, uh, and some because they realized that they could not express themselves anymore professionally if they were in media uh, or maybe uh, doing some other things, and because they had been activists and they realized it's a choice of, as Ivan mentioned, be a martyr, right? Do you choose to be a martyr? Some did. Okay, I, I just want to push back a little bit uh, on that, right? I mean, I, I, I understand, of course, what you're saying, but you know, I'm, I'm struck at the comparison between what's happened or not happened in Russia and what we saw in Iran with the headscarf mm -hmm. struggles, right? I mean, the regime is no less repressive, the consequences are no less severe, and yet you had all of these people go out on the streets, you know, week after week. You were expecting that question, no? Yes, yeah. I was. I was, and it did. Uh, I, I always watch it in consternation because not only do they take uh, to the streets in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, men and women, but many of them get killed right away on the spot. You, you know, Iranian government opens fire at the crowd. Oh, the Russian government has not done that. Never. We never had that. Uh, I don't have an answer to this. This is a different culture. Uh, probably it takes to be an Iranian. Um, um, as uh, I think I tried to more or less explain how I see the general mindset in Russia and uh, loyalty that Ivan mentioned is important and uh, the history, especially the uh, decades of Soviet history taught people out of independent organization. Uh, which is something that is in the historical memory or even the real memory of a uh, somewhat older generation, like my own. Um, so this is not new. It is not that, you know, uh, again, Iran also had this very abrupt turn in its history, uh, but um, acquiescence, um, aversion to political organization, and even to social organization. Um, a colleague of, uh, of ours, uh, um, Sam Green, came up with this brilliant expression which he called aggressive immobility. This is uh, a desire to encapsulate, to carve out a small world for yourself and uh, try to pretend nothing is going on around you or to the extent that you only can. Okay, yeah. Well, first of all, with I Iran, the difference with Iran is that uh, Iran is an uh, Islamic Republic since 1979. Those who participate in the protest now were born and raised under the, this regime. It is a generation already, like the modern generation. In Russia, those people who are witness now the brutal uh, suppression just recently, just like five years ago, participated in the open protest in the LGBTQ demonstration, official, um, I mean, officially permitted demonstration on the street. All that generation just witnessed, uh, like, over, almost overnight, the uh, state became brutal, and the state started to kill people. That's actually the biggest uh, fear of the people who, who, who learned Soviet history, that the state can start killing people. And it's actually just started it when it started the war in Ukraine, because there is no big difference between I mean, killing, you know, bombing, Kharkov or bombing, Varonish, you know, that's a, and that is something which happened. And that, that makes people shocked, and that is, uh, the reaction could not be the same as, uh, if, you know, if, if uh, um, as, as, as it was in, in Iran. And I also wanted to, to add that, um, you know, that I would say that if during the first year of the war, the war was the major, uh, I would say, major problem, the major uh, reason of, of, uh, of Russians to be, um, um, you know, 
to, to, to be under stress. By, by now, by 2024, I guess that the domestic repressions actually replace the war in this agenda. People, the war, you know, there is not, not much war news. During the last year, that was not a big uh, battles, nothing like huge atrocities even. But uh, the domestic uh, atmosphere were changing uh, like very rapidly. And by 2024, the domestic atmosphere became very repressive. And that's actually, if you uh, talk to Russians, at least the Russians who are not, of course, not living in Belgrade or somewhere, or did not have some close relative fighting in the front line. But for, 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 for this average uh, Russian, uh, the oppressive atmosphere, the change of the nature of the regime is much bigger concern now than, than the war itself. Because it's all, and uh, Maria was, was very, uh, very, very uh, correctly said that uh, the state start to interfere, to interfere into, into everything, into education, into school education. Many people are afraid of what is going on in, in schools. You know, the parents uh, whose children are attending schools are very much afraid what is going on in, in, in Russian state schools, how they started to indoctrinate, indoctrinate people with this new type of ideology and what is going on in the universities, what is going on in the, uh, even in the families, in the church, everywhere. The, and that has actually became the concern for much more, I would say, much bigger portion of Russian people than those who were concerned about the war itself. Yes. You would have one thing, if possible. There was um, one man uh, in Russia who was able to, uh, at least was trying very hard to break uh, away from this, uh, self-constraints from uh, people's aversion to social and polit political organization was Alexei Navalny. And he was indeed able to become a people's leader. And he was able to uh, energize people and uh, uh, encourage them to take to the streets uh, and later engage them in politics uh, with uh, a movement that he started. Uh, but uh, uh, Alexei Navalny in this, I think, was very unique and this ability to organize people, to energize people, and to engage them in politics. Alexei Navalny is serving uh, such a long term in prison and in high security prison in the far north now that he himself said that uh, his term is uh, as long as his life or the life of this regime. And I, I'm afraid that he's right. Uh, Ivan, I wanted to follow up. You mentioned that uh, that the atmosphere has affected the educational system a great deal. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's hard for us to imagine, sitting in a, a fantastic you know, college in Massachusetts, uh, how it is that the war has affected the way that professors are teaching, the way that students are able to express themselves or talk with each other or trust each other. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I will start probably with uh, institutional changes. You know, There were several... Uh, universities, several uh, uh, schools in, 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 in Russia, which were uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of ahead of, of, of the rest in, in, in introducing the like, uh, new advanced methods of teaching or you know, liberal arts uh, uh, curriculum. And actually, uh, most of them were very much integrated into international, uh, international educational uh, networks. And scholarly and scientific network. So that was, and those uh, were the first target of the state repression. You know, we, even before the war, just half a year before the war started, uh, Smolny, which used to be the uh, faculty of uh, St. Petersburg State University, it was a joint, joint project between St. Uh, Petersburg State University and the Bard College in New York. Uh, and it was uh, like, it was closed. Bart College was uh, labeled undesirable organization. It's uh, one of the new labels invented by this regime. And if if the person uh, continue contacts with undesirable organization, he can, this is a criminal case. He or she can be prosecuted. So that was first first uh, blow. And uh, most of the I would say majority of. Uh, uh, of, of professors of Smolny now somewhere abroad. Uh, then it was Shaninka, one of the uh, new style universities in uh, branch of the universities in Moscow. That was also my own European university is still alive, 
but it also suffered because, well, European University was also one of the of this new brand of new type of, of, of educational institutions, and I, I would say that uh, I cannot say how big uh, portion of the uh, professors emigrated, but uh, I, I, I'm afraid it's almost uh, half of, 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 of those who taught in, in, Europe, in my own university two years ago are now somewhere, again, in the United States, in Europe, or in Armenia, or whatever. And that is for, for several reasons, and for, for political reasons, they do not want to, to stay in Russia because of the war, for being afraid of being mobilized, and because of the pressure, state pressure against the university. The university is now under the prosecution office uh, investigation since last May, and it uh, creates a very nervous atmosphere. Nobody knows, will, will the university survive the next uh, semester or maybe the next week even, because we already suffered several uh, closures in, in the past. And that is, uh, for the state universities, for the big state universities, the situation was even worse because it immediately started to, f uh, to uh, pressure the uh, professors who were more like liberal-minded and those who were like public intellectuals who were uh, noticeable, uh, who, who can be noticed from, from uh, afar. And again, High School of Economics was used to be a leading the leading university in, in Russia, and many people uh, from there. It, it depends, as far as I understand, it depends on the department. Some departments still somehow survive, and some others were destroyed totally, and people people also immigrated or lost lost their jobs. And uh, and what we also see. You know, journalists, as uh, Maria told, um, journalists were the first target of the state repression. The journalists were like hundreds of already by now, hundreds of journalists were labeled uh, foreign agent. And until recently, uh, professors were not. You know, all, all the professors. And now we see that uh, professors uh, became this. Uh, the target of this law for an agent. Mm -hmm. So it means, uh, according to Russian law, you cannot teach. If you are if you are for an agent, you lose your job, you, you, you cannot teach anymore. And that's something that is uh, used, used against them uh, to, to, to keep this uh, atmosphere of un uncertainty, uh, certainty for those who, who, who continue teaching. And at some universities, again, this is not in mine, but some colleagues from big universities are complaining that they are now afraid to speak freely with students. It, it, it never happened before. I mean, even two years ago, well, there was no such a concern. But now they're concerned because it can be somebody who will report that you, told, you said something against the special military operation or whatever. And the people are you know, just complaining that they, they need to, to, to be quiet. And that is actually a very, uh, very negative development, and we don't know how it's, it's became worse and worse with every month. Well, let's take advantage of the fact that we don't have that problem here. And I would like to invite the audience to, uh, to ask questions of our distinguished panel. I think, uh, Professor Tamarkin, you want people to come to the microphone to ask yes, questions? Could you come to the, to the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, hi, it's nice to be here tonight. Um, I'm from Ukraine myself, mm -hmm. and the main concern for me is peace in my country and the end of the war. Um, the main question is, do Russian citizens even matter at stopping this war? Because as, we, as you have told us, the information that they receive is very limited, mm -hmm. and the um, initial bet of Western countries was to pressure um, Russian public into the fear of sanctions, yet it didn't work in many aspects of their lives. Um, their lives, many of their lives um, in general were changed very low. Mm -hmm. um, and even like military sector uh, um, did not change because a lot of uh, parts that Russians use, they come from European companies, American companies, they find ways to do the parallel import. Um, and even after 
uh, these two years. Um, a lot of notorious politicians here, like Donald Trump, says he can stop the war with just one call, which, and, which he refers to talking to Putin himself and not the Russian public, highlighting the fact that um, there is no dialogue with Russian citizens. So my ultimate question is, do Russian citizens even matter at stopping this war? Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, uh, let me start with sanctions. It, uh, you know, the Russian society during this 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, was uh, just partially integrated into this international uh, networks, into international travels, international uh, consumer, consumer life. And those mostly were people who live in big cities, who had a better education. And this part of the population was you know, predominantly against the war from the very beginning. And that actually, but the sanctions, by definition, sanctions imposed by the Western uh, countries hit most of all this group. Those who live in the small towns who actually been mobilized to fight the war never traveled abroad, never buy, buy anything from European or, or you know, American uh, company. And they actually lost almost nothing with this change. So this uh, sanctions hit mostly anti, uh, more, more or less an anti-war group. And then, then it hits those who are the major, major base of, of, of the war. Unfortunately, I don't have a good, uh, good answer for what could Russian stop the war. Because what, as, I, as I try to explain, this is a dictatorship. Uh, if, well, uh, you know, even this, uh, polls that um, Maria described so aptly uh, actually say that if uh, people would be asked about should we continue the war or stop, majority will say let's stop. But nobody will ask. <laughs> and, and the people will not dare, at least for now, I don't see this uh, possibility to dare to start an uprising or something. Because to start an uprising, it should be some uh, structures, some networks which are were destroyed or never existed in Russia. And that is why I'm pretty um, pessimistic about the possibility of stopping the war from, the, uh, from, from this popular, popular protest. What can happen, of course, something in the elites in the group uh, around Putin, but I am not a specialist, I cannot say how it developed and what, <laughs> what can, can be changed now. We saw Prigozhin last year, it was like unexpected, but uh, very, very <laughs> strong blow on the popularity. And I, I don't think that uh, Putin is very, really strong now in, 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 in office, uh, as, as, as some people uh, presume. Even, you know, even the mobilization in the uh, late September of 2022, of course it was a result of the well, kind of consequences of the uh, Russian army loss, losses on the, in the eastern Ukraine, but also uh, from my my perspective, it was also the response to, uh, to, the very, uh, to, the, to, to, to the situation when Putin felt vulnerable because, because of this uh, loss of the territories before that, that, before that was uh, conquered by, by, by Russian forces, it looked like inside Russia, it looked like, okay, Putin is a lame duck, Putin is losing, Putin losing in Ukraine and it's probably something will happen, some coup d'etat, whatever, because and the next day, Putin announced the mobilization. So the whole agenda changed, and that is. So it was not only response to the front line, but it's also response to the, his domestic uh, position. But uh, I don't think he is as strong in his. But we don't know. We uh, I, I I don't want to be uh, to, to promise something. <laughs> I don't be too overly optimistic here. It's we we are now in a very pessimistic uh, stage of life. Do you want me to add? Uh, so I fully agree, unfortunately, with the pessimism. Um, and I would add to this that the activists either fled or are in jail. All the major people who were actively anti-government and prepared to fight in any way are either gone or in jail. Uh, one more point is um, about sanctions. 
And uh, uh, as you probably know, some of the sanctions are um, uh, sanctions against the Russian economy or Russian finance, but some were personal. And personal sanctions meant uh, uh, to somehow punish the Russian elites for being loyal to Putin. Uh, this, in my view, was a very unwise act because instead of uh, probably that was the expectation, pushing those people to rebel against Putin, they uh, actually pushed them closer to Putin because sanctions meant that their assets abroad are frozen, that if they find themselves in the West, they might actually face any kind of uh, very unpleasant developments having to do with uh, uh, their residents uh, uh, in foreign countries, their assets in foreign countries, their businesses in foreign countries. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, instead of um, uh, pushing them toward um, maybe trying to persuade, trying to act in any kind of way against the war, they are now captives of Putin, and this is what personal sanctions have done. So um, usually the conversation in Russia, for as long as I can remember myself, it's either from below or from above. What can happen to the regime? Either people will rebel and rise, or actually there will be some kind of coup, something happening at the top, Putin dies, what have you. So from the top or from below. Now, uh, uh, I fully agree with Ivan that from below is out of the question. From the top, at this point in time, uh, the elites are arguably even more loyal to the regime because they have a lot more to lose. Well, let me just a little bit of optimism to it. <laughs> <laughs> to this, yeah, a very little, little bit. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you know, uh, it's about my feeling, of course, it's not the polls, but uh, when the regime turned to be repressive in so quickly, in so, so short term, it looked in many cases, it looked like the huge, you know, the regime is uh, just few people on the top and um, more than million and millions of people who work for the state apparatus in the state, I mean, or, or in, on different positions in the law enforcement, in the administrative capacity and, you know, through all the country. It's a huge country and big uh, state apparatus. And it looked like uh, the state apparatus did not uh, wanted to, 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 to act according to the top will. It looked like uh, even the law enforcement did not want to pursue everybody who, who, was, who were vocal against the war. It looked like many people inside the state were very unhappy about what they are forced to do. It was a you know, political will from the top, but for thousands and tens of thousands of people, it was an expected term. You know. They were a loyal members of the state, but they do not want to be loyal members of the repressive state. That's a difference. And it looked like, in many cases, they like sabotage or <laughs> that's, uh, the decision. But, uh, but it develops. And of course, uh, such a people are you know, being replaced and uh, steadily, steadily, uh, the apparatus became also repressive. But, uh, yeah, that's... that's <laughs> that was that was an optimism that is that still that, that, as a top is that still there are unhappy people there are still many people are unhappy <laughs> against in the, again in the apart will they rebel or not it's a different story yeah <laughs> sorry sorry I could not try I tried hello I want to thank you for the beautiful lecture it was really interesting. Um, I'm also a student from Ukraine, and I have a bunch of questions. So I'll start with the first one. It's like, uh, what's your opinion of recent changes in high military commander of Ukraine, and especially the replacement of the chief commander, would affect mm. the war? Do you have any opinions about it? <laughs> Outside of Not the topic. Yeah, yeah, okay. well, yeah, I can yeah. change it. I, I, I can, yyeah. Oh. I can confess I cannot say anything. I, I'm not, oh. I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm trying not to comment anything which is going on in Ukraine. Being a Russian citizen, I feel like, well, it's not not good thing. I never commented even. The, and I don't follow, actually, the military uh, changes in the, no, okay. in the Ukraine. Yeah, I, I, know, I know what happened, but I can, can nothing sure. to say. Thank you. Can I ask another one? Mm -hmm. So you told, both of you told that, like, a lot of people left the Russia, and uh, I was curious, is there a demographic crisis currently happening in Russia? Are there, like, 
a lot of uh, free jobs and not enough people working anywhere. Can you like comment about it, please? Okay. Excellent yeah. question. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, Russia is an aging country, like so many countries in Europe. So people of um, older age groups are much more numerous than younger people in this current cohort of those between 18 and 24. This is how demographers work. This is the younger cohort. Uh, it, is the, um, it is especially small. Those who come after them, teenagers, are more numerous. So this in itself is a problem. Um, for a country at war, for the obvious reason. You are exactly right, there's a shortage of workforce in Russia. This is very, you know, strongly felt in the industries uh, with so many young men who left fleeing a mobilization. Many more young people who uh, actually are being killed and wounded and continue fighting, and in all three categories are a loss to the workforce. Uh, this is uh, a very grim prospect for the future because a small generation, people who are entering the workforce 18 to 24 and people who are, are um, at, the, at the age when they marry and have children or soon to marry and have children, so they are becoming even smaller and of course there will be much fewer children bo born. Um, the way it affects the workforce is that uh, Many industries, actually there's uh, what goes on is stealing workforce from one industry to another and of course the main stealer, uh, um, the main thief here is the military industrial complex. The, uh, of course the army uh, to begin with and military industrial complex uh, is second one, uh, which means that for the rest the only way to attract workforce is to raise salaries and this is going on. Um, just how unhealthy it is for the economy, I don't have to explain to you. In a country that is at war, whose uh, you know, productive part of the economy is shrinking, to be also, um, uh, you know, feel the need to raise people's, pe people's uh, um, salaries is uh, uh, really destructive for the economy. There are many destructive processes, and I mean, uh, what we've said, and Ivani and I completely agree that uh, you know, uh, there is no reason to expect anything uh, that will end this war, but uh, we're not, we never mention the time frame. So <laughs> the only thing that is optimistic is that we don't know the future. I think this is a really only op optimistic thing that I may say. There are lots and lots of problems, and demographic problem, as you rightly noticed, is one among them. Thank you. Okay. So let, let's think about something a little bit more hopeful. Let's say Putin dies. <laughs> um, suddenly something happens and Putin dies. Now we know there's a succession, right? The prime minister would become, I guess, acting president, you know, and so on. But what, do you have any kind of vision of a scenario, a post-Putin scenario, um, what it would mean for the war, what it would mean for the regime? Um, let's just all think about Putin dead, um, <laughs> and, and then what? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nina. You, you know, <laughs> I, I would say that I know like several people uh, in Russia and especially in immigration who are thinking about the, this post-Putin future. This is probably the only uh, way the political scientists, social scientists can now uh, engage themselves in, 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 in thinking about the, uh, about Russia and that is uh, so they have several several scenarios and um, of course we cannot uh, say what, what what happens what what I would dare to predict is to say that there will no be new, no new Putin I mean that is uh, the Putin is a person who uh, created this type of uh, political machine that he's only one only himself, uh, only Putin can be Putin. I mean, nobody uh, among his uh, inner circle, like Narishkin or Patrushev or whoever, Mishustin, who is technically should be his replacement, uh, will be uh, so sure to uh, in power to you know to balance different interests in different groups 
and those groups uh, possess even the military forces. You have, you have several different uh, uh, agencies with uh, military forces from like FSB, Army, uh, and uh, Federal, uh, uh, what is it, F F FSO, yeah. <laughs> so a, lo a lot of, you know, that's a Federal Guard, you know, also Russian Guard. So that should be a balance, and also balance between diff different economics. So nobody will be uh, able to just to, to, to get on the Putin's uh, slippers and, you know, and, and, and continue as it was. So that is a chance, <laughs> that is a chance that even those people who are now looked like uh, uh, like warmongers and uh, supporters of Putin will need to uh, to start some type of, uh, if not democratization, to some type of uh, talks, some of round table, something to decide and not to kill each other. Actually, what happened even after Stalin's death, you know, and maybe in in a better shape right now because there is the society is uh, still not not the society of 1953. It's more. Uh, more active society, more educated society. So I would say that uh, after Putin there should be uh, a change, uh, should be uh, and will be uh, some steps toward normalization. Okay. And of course whoever will come after Putin will need to restore at least part, part, uh, partly the relations of uh, Russia with, this, with the West, which means that he will need to to stop the war and to start negotiation of how to get out of the uh, everything that, that Putin done in these two years. That is, I, I think this is inevitable. All the rest is, uh, we'll see. I hope, we'll, I hope to, to, to be able to see it, to witness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nina. I hate this question. I'm exactly Putin's age, same year, same month. And the idea that, you know, uh, you know, for any change, we need to uh, <laughs> wait for him to die makes me think I will never, un unlike Ivan, I will never live to see it. Uh, and uh, uh, there were indeed rumors circulating up until a few years, or up until a few months ago, I think it was still common to say, well, he's dying, he has this, he has that, he has cancer. Uh, well, it turned out it was all wrong. And I think William Burns was the one, the head of the CIA, who said, this is nonsense. Nothing of this is true. He's totally healthy, he has excellent doctors, he's athletic, he's not a drinker, he'll live a long life. Uh, but one thing um, of, what, um, of what Ivan said, uh, I think is really, it may be uh, actually um, an opening to what is in store, and this is Stalin's death. And some political observers and analysts have talked about it, because Stalin died in 1953. He was a tyrant, much worse than Putin is. Uh, and uh, he was uh, so much more important, more powerful, and an intimidating figure who everyone uh, in his elite was afraid of, that his death was immediately followed by in a struggle. And it, it was a vicious struggle with blood on the floor in the very little, literal sense of the word. So some of um, our colleagues actually have suggested something of the sort. Uh, should I say if, well, Putin will die at some point, when Putin dies, that uh, with uh, so much power concentrated in his hands, with nobody being in, even remotely close to him in, um, in power, there's bound to be a struggle. Uh, there's be, uh, because uh, uh, Putin's elite uh, has never lived without the big boss. Nobody is more important than another guy. How do they decide what the power structure is going to be? There's bound to be a fight and maybe a reconcil reconciliation after a while for, you know, for the mere uh, instinct of survival. So I would expect something of the sort, but then again, <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to see him die soon. <laughs> um, this question is specifically to Mr. Kurila. Um, what does make you think that the government that will uh, follow um, after Putin dies will be more liberal than him? Because um, the people that currently have some sort of po power, um, and a lot of them are in prison, like Strelkov, um, or like the, the people that seem more active sort of 
uh, pushers of their ideas in Russia. There, uh, I mean, I know there are a lot of like right radicals, uh, especially like even in Moscow that those they said they claim that you know Moscow is for <laughs> mm -hmm. Moscow people, all those guys. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the question is, why do they be liberal rather than far right? Okay, I don't remember if I said liberal, but uh, you know, this is about it, it, yep. this is not about the persons; it's about institutions, and that is institutionally they need to get into uh, into talks. I mean, that's what 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 Maria said. You know, uh, each of, each of them can be very each person can be a very unpleasant person, <laughs> I would say. But if there are like few of them, like you know, 20, 10 of them should need to, to get uh, to, to some uh, decision, to some solution of, of what is going on. And they need to, to start talk, talking. And they start talking and not killing each other. <laughs> and they start talking. That makes uh, the whole system like a step out of this personal dictatorship which is going on. It's not a liberalism, yes, of course it's not, but it's a step which can be at some point, if you, and this is a big dream, but you know, in, in some steps ahead, we'll need, somebody with them will be also need to find uh, allies uh, among the uh, like lower levels of the society, mm -hmm. or those who can, can be called for the, to the streets. To, and I guess even, you know, uh, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, the next day Putin will die, <laughs> we'll see thousands of maybe millions of people on the streets. Pe people, because those people who are afraid now, who are feeling that they are mm, intimidated, that can be sent to prison, next day they know that something changed, will try to, to express themselves, to, to, to behave, and we'll see these millions of people. And that will be a game changer. Even for those who are on top, they, some of them will try to make alliance with the people on the street. So, but again, this is too, uh, too much of the <laughs> of, of, of the dreams here. Yeah. Okay, right finally. Right. I found <laughs> All right. I think. Okay. Okay, thank, I think you. thank you. I think on a, after a very minor topic and a minor key to end on a major one <laughs> is is really good. I'd like to give a hearty thanks to our speakers, Ivan Kurila, Maria Lipman, and our sagacious moderator, Alexandra Bakru. Thank you very much. <laughs>